Okay. Uh, good evening, Dr. Coney. Nice to meet. Nice to be with you. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. No problem. Um, could you start off with just talking about like who you are, where you come from, what you do, all those things? Uh, sure. So my name is Joseph Coney. Um, I'm a retina specialist here in, here in Northeast Ohio. Um, I'm in private practice at a retina social Cleveland, which covers the north the Northeast Ohio. Um, I was brought up in Chicago on the south side, and I was one. Grew up with uh, very little means. Um, I went and went through high school um, in an urban area, predominantly all American, uh, sorry, African American school, and found myself at University of Illinois. Um, University of Illinois, I received my bachelor's degree in, in biology and later attended Loyola Medical School, which is also a suburb of Chicago. Mm. And my train, my tie to Northeast Ohio was I did my ophthalmology training here at Case Western. Uh, I did a year at Harvard uh, for medical retina, uh, and spe specializing in diabetic retinopathy, and intensive surgical training in Memphis, Tennessee, and came back to join some of my professors here in Ohio. Um, these are the great uh, experience that I had here in training. Okay, and um, what what led you towards med medicine in high school and undergrad, all the things that led up to that? You know, I think I always had an interest in the sciences. You know, I early on, I knew I was good with my hands. I was an athlete, you know, so I had very good hand-eye coordination. Um, I spent my summers oftentimes working with my baseball coach um, doing construction work. He was one of our drafting teachers. I did four, well, I did three as a drafting in high school. And I thought architecture would, would have been a good fit for me. And so I, I started my, my journey on, on to architecture as I thought I was, when I was going to the University of Illinois. Uh, in my high school career, being my sophomore year, I had a, a tragedy in the family where my young niece um, died of chicken pox. And, you know, at that time, you know, there was no vaccine. We all got, we all received chicken pox. We all, you know, came out unscathed, have a little bumps here and there. But her journey was a little bit atypical. Instead of the chicken pox um, coming out, they actually internalized, infected all of her organs. Uh, she had an extremely high elevated uh, fever of about 110. Uh, her, she had complete system shutdown from her kidneys to her brain to her lungs. I mean, every complication you can have from chicken pox, uh, this child developed. And I was very angry um, with the doctors, I was very angry at that time, I think, with, you know, with, with the God, I couldn't understand how someone is, at a very young age should be taken away from us. And so that started my journey and my curiosity into medicine. Um, and I've always enjoyed the sciences. And later when I matriculated to University of Illinois, I had a good group of friends that were pre-med and I was just taking classes with them just to be social. And later that led me onto the, into the, um, to the idea of actually going to medicine. Okay, very, very interesting. Um, where did you go to medical school? If you don't mind sharing that. So, you know, home is Chicago. And I always thought, you know, because I'm from a large family, I will always end up in Chicago. Um, I ended up at, at Loyola, it was quite interesting. You know, Loyola, applying for medical school is very competitive. And I don't care where, you know, where you are in your training, there's all, you know, there's only a certain amount of numbers of people, you know, that can enter in, in one's class. Um, I did very well in undergrad. I, you know, I, I had, you know, straight A's for my first two years. I, I did everything I could to, 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 to be the best student. And when I applied to medical school, I applied to 30 programs. I probably received about 15 interviews. Um, and I was waitlisted on seven programs. What that really means is that you're not in, in medical school until you get accepted. And this was a very humbling experience. What I did in my summers is that I, um, there's a program in Chicago called Chicago Health and Area Careers Program, which is still there. We call it CHAMPS. And CHAMPS put underserved minorities into programs in, in summers into different programs. So one program I did specifically was shadowing medical students at, at Chicago Medical School. Um, well, Lo and behold, the dean of the school at Chicago Medical School became the dean of Loyola. And this hopes me up because it's still touching. 
you know, she, she became Dean and she saw my name on the waiting list and she calls me up and she said, if I'm not committed to a medical program, she would love to have me in that year's class. So one medical school, uh, Loyola, and I'm sorry about this because this still chokes me up, but you know, you never know who you come in contact with. And she did a lot for my career. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, why did you choose ophthalmology? What led you to that path? You know, orthopedic surgery was a great fit. And so that's kind of how I started when I decided to go into medical school. And when I went, when I did some of the uh, rotation ophthalmology, just hanging out with some of the, some of the, some of the orthopedic surgeons, you know, there was a lot of chopping, there was a lot of drilling, there was a lot of hammering, and I wanted something a little more finesse. So I thought about cardiothoracic surgery, and so this is I knew something sur surgical I was going to do, and I love the I love the complexity of the heart, and I was doing my OB rotation, and I was about a third year medical student, and I sat next to a gentleman who was very fair skinned, and you know we had a general conversation, and somewhere in the conversation he was like you know the conversation changes to something that was very serious, young man. So what are you going to do the rest of your life? And I sat there. And I'm like, wow, that's a serious question. And so I go and tell him what I was thinking about doing. He was like, you don't sound really convinced. He's like, I want you to come and I want to show you what I do. But he was a retina specialist. And so this started my quest to ophthalmology after seeing what he does in his office, seeing you know, the first time what, what an optic nerve looks like to see in the retina. And there was very similarities to what we do, well, what the cardiologist does and to what can happen in the retina. You know, retina is, is a very big organ when it comes, comes to cardiovascular disease. It's the leading cause of blindness from diabetes, from strokes in the eyes, from retinal detachments. It's very intricate. And so he offered me a lot of things that um, cardiothoracic surgery didn't do in terms of quality of life, um, uh, you know, being outpatient, and actually a longitudinal re a perspective when following my patients. Okay, and could you also clear up, just in case any students are wondering, the difference between ophthalmology and optometry? Sure, so ophthalmology are physicians. Uh, we, we have to complete four years of medical school, we have to complete four years of residency, and then you do your training in ophthalmology, which is three years. Then I did an additional three years following that, total 15 years total. Optometry, after finishing college, they go to optometry school where they become a doctor of, of optometry. Um, and so they they specialize in you know glasses contacts. Uh, they do have some uh, uh, some decision making when it comes to the eyes, but for the most part, uh, they're non surgeons. Okay, and I know you're a really busy man. So in what you do on a day to day basis changes a lot. But could you talk about what you do, the days that you're in surgery and the days that you're in the clinic? So I do have some days where I'm just in the operating room and I have some days which are split where I would go to the clinic and then I'll go to surgery. Essentially, um, my all day surgery days, I start about 730 in the morning and it all depends on the day. You know, being a surgeon, you really have no control over what comes in. Um, but my but my but my, my my typical my typical day in surgery, I'm 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 normally done by one or two o'clock. I have been here to seven o'clock at night. It all depends on what's going on. I'm the Friday guy, so there's a lot of emergencies. Um, but because I do all my own surgery center, we try to be respectful, respectful to everyone's time. The clinic is actually very diverse too. Uh, the majority of patients are coming in for routine problems, macular degeneration, diabetes, scar tissue, flashes, lights, and floaters, any kind of disease that affect the back of the eye. We do a fair amount of treatments in the eye as well. Probably 75% of my patients that come into clinic are also getting treatments when they come in. So we're doing treatments constantly, whether it's in the clinic or the operating room. In the operating room, those people are really reserved for things you cannot treat in the office, whether it's scar tissue from diabetic retinopathy, where it's a retinal detachment, where you can't, you, know, you can't fix it, you can't laser or fix in the office, uh, whether it's trauma, someone get you know, uh, a gunshot wound to the eye or a foreign body to the eye. Uh, these are a little bit more invasive. Uh, most patients stay awake and it's all outpatient surgery. Okay, sounds good. Could you also talk a little bit about uh, what research you're involved in, what you do, the boards you serve on, all of that? So another good reason why I chose ophthalmology is because I learned early on that in ophthalmology, you can do a fair amount of, of clinical research. I love clinical research. I knew before I went to medical school, I was working for Abbott Laboratories, and 
I worked in, you know, several laboratories before then, and I knew that it would not want to, did not want to be in the laboratory. I was a people person. But clinical trials um, is very, I'm very passionate about. We've been doing clinical trials in our practice since the, uh, since the, since the mid 1970s, and we probably have done over 250 clinical trials. Every drug on the market to treat the eye, our practice was very instrumental in getting those drugs to market to treat diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, strokes in the eyes, and things of the sort. Uh, it gives me the bring it to trial and then get it through the FDA um, so we can better find uh, treatments for our community. The great thing about clinical trials is that you can often uh, offer uh, individuals sometimes better medicines and better drugs than they wouldn't have been um, uh, offered if those drugs were available. And when I have someone that um, come from either underinsured or no, or, or no insurance, I can get them in clinical trials where we can get them when we, they don't have any kind of payment whatsoever. The companies will make them whole and um, they, get the, they get the treatment that they need. And um, why is it so important to you to diversify medicine? What, what's, what do you think the significance in that is? You know, medicine, um, depending on where you are, you know, is, is not, you, you can go through a whole day and not see someone like you. And it's comforting when you can see people in the hall that looks like you, that, 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 that represents the fabric of the, of, of the community. The reason why I work as hard as I do and I do all the extra things is because if you want a voice, you need to be at the table. If you want to make a change, you need to be at the table. And for me, you know, helping younger physicians or, or, or younger students get their dreams become a physician, I think is kind of where my passion is. I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm 15 years into what I do. I love what I do, but I think my passion is really bringing up the next generation. You know, we all stand on shoulders of other people. I'm aware of that. I did not get here on my own. So sitting here with you is a way to help you achieve your dreams. And I'm hoping other people listen to this can actually see the same way, but that's the reason why it's important. Yeah, I completely agree. And how do you, how do you, I know in your field, you have to work as a team and work with other doctors, whether it's referring to other, referring patients to other doctors or anything like that. So how do you, how do you, what is it like to work with people that just aren't like you or just how does, how do you deal with that? Things like that. Cause I know some students might be bothered with just being in a room or being in an office, being not looking anything like anyone else there. Well, I think you know, no matter what you do in life, you, you know, you may feel like the unicorn in the room. Um, you have to be comfortable who you are. You have to be comfortable in, comfortable in your skill set. And you just have to be ready when your name is called in order to do what you have to do. And so that's across the board. It's not, that's, 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 that's true of everything. It's not, it's not just medicine. Um, you have to be well-trained. You, you have to know your craft. You put your time into your craft. Um, it takes a long time to get proficient no matter what you do, whether it's learning how to drive a car or it's learning how to take someone's appendix out. So I look at it as the um, uh, exact same way. What I would say when it comes to working with the people, I think it's important to have an open mind, um, to learn how to learn from your mistakes. It's okay to be wrong, but you don't want to be wrong the next time. You have to learn something to rectify that. Um, part of part, the reason why training is so hard and so long is because it's not, it's not just important to learn things the right way. It's also learn things, not, you know, how to do something the wrong way. How do you, how do you improve someone's outcomes? Throughout medicine, medicine will change. There will, there won't be treatments for some things that by the time you get through your training, there will be treatments for that you will have to adapt to. Um, and part of that is, 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 is a long road to get where you want to be because they're, you know, none of us are perfect. Okay. You know, I tell this to my kids all the time. Both of my children are interested in medicine and I tell my daughter, you know, um, you can do everything right. You can, you can give the right drugs, you can do the right surgery and yet your patient dies. We don't control who lives or who dies. You just do the best you can. You make the best decisions. And I think if you do that as a leadership in, in, in your team, your team will respect you. You have to have an open mind that if you think something is supposed to happen, 
the way you want it to, you have to be willing to adopt a change and be open to listen to other ones' ideas. And um, yeah, I completely agree that in the field like medicine, you can't be stubborn, you can't you know be prideful. But um, I also wanted to ask you about you know your missions trips to Haiti's your excuse me missions trips to Haiti, and what exactly is it that you do there, and you know what you know there's obviously a lot of problems in the world so what are some issues that students can or what should students be more aware of and issues that they can address trip i would highly recommend it um, i've done mission trips since i was in medical school i've probably done about five or six different ones but in haiti for the past five years i have a commitment to help train uh general ophthalmologists to do retina surgery the leading cause of blindness right now in Haiti is actually individuals um, going blind for retina problems, mostly from diabetes, because they don't have any retina specialists. You know, there's 3.5 million people in Haiti and yet not one retina specialist. Uh, that country was only built for probably a, a million people, so it's overpopulated um, and the conditions there are not great. Uh, so myself and a couple of colleagues, we go there and we train people there the same way that we train them here in, in, in America. And last year, we were able to give the first general ophthalmologist a training certificate as a first trained retina surgeon in Haiti. And so we're looking to do this uh, same type of program in different parts of Haiti and maybe even go to different parts of the world. It sounds good. Um, Dr. Seltzer, do you have any questions? No, I just wanna say, Dr. Coney, you are really the perfect person for what we're trying to do here with the first ever uh, University of Cincinnati Healthcare Workforce Diversity Symposium. You really moved me with your comments and I think um, what you're doing here is exactly what um, somebody gave to you many years ago. So thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I completely agree with her. Um, if there was any lasting piece of advice you'd want to give to any pre-med students and medical students, anyone watching this, what would it be? I think the most important thing that I've learned along the way is don't let people take away your dreams. You know, all throughout my career, I was told that I wasn't good enough to do, to do this. I didn't have the hands to do this. I wasn't smart enough to go to a predominantly white school. Um, I wouldn't be a good retina surgeon. I mean, I haven't heard this even later in my career. I don't hear it now because, you know, I'm out there, I'm doing what I do. But through training, you know, there are roadblocks, there's, there's I'll call them obstacles, and there are some people out there that don't want you to succeed. If there is something that you really want to do, I think the best thing to do is to find a mentor, you know, find you know, projects and, 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 and programs um, to, to achieve your dream and don't stop giving up. I think that will be the one thing I will leave everyone. That's truly great advice, something I'll take to heart. Um, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Coney, and being with us. You gave us a lot of great things, and I hope students can learn something from this. No, no problem, Josh. It was a pleasure. Okay. All right. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Bye, Dr. Sister.